You might be wondering who won the space race, and anybody who was an American would tell you it was the Americans. Yeah, that's right. USA, first to the moon, blah, 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 blah. Yes, that is true. However, many accomplishments in space and the exploration of space weren't actually down to the Americans. A lot of it was down to the Soviet Union. And if we're talking about people that were there first into space, then they win hand over fist. And it's no wonder. The Soviets were first many of humanity's milestones when it came to going into space, such as the first Earth orbiting satellite in history, the first nation to successfully send a living organism into orbit, the first cosmic rocket sent into orbit, the first spacecraft to reach the surface of the moon, photographing the far side of the moon, the first man to reach space, and the first shuttle to make a complete single orbit around Earth. This was everything that the USSR achieved prior to the 18th of March 1965, when they became the first nation to achieve a spacewalk. Alexei Lernov of the Voxshot 2 was the first to achieve this feat. It is pretty much this that we are talking about today. The Voskhod 3KD spacecraft had two members on board, Pavel Belyaev and Alexei Leonov. The purpose of the mission was to complete a 12 minute spacewalk. So did they go into space, push him out of the airlock and then just let him float around for a little bit? No, no, no. There was some actual science behind this. They were prepared, guys. The airlock would basically have an inflatable deck that would spring out of the side of the aircraft, so anybody that wanted to do a spacewalk would simply go out the airlock and into the inflatable bag, shall we say. But technically, this is a spacewalk, as you're in space. After use, the airlock could be then just simply jettisoned. The way the ship was constructed meant that the ejection seat in the spacecraft was removed from the standard design, and two standard seats were added instead. Therefore, there was absolutely no provision for the crew to escape in the event of emergency, which sounds like a swell idea. This will all play a part later, and we will of course get on to, you know, the bears, but one step at a time, people. All you need to know is airlock in spacecraft, and in order to achieve that, they simply removed the emergency ejection seats, which was a very, very smart play, clearly. Alexei was designated the job to undertake the first ever spacewalk, to which he had the specialist suit designed to allow him to undertake this feat without coming to harm. This was a specialist backpack that provided 45 minutes of breathing and cooling. Oxygen vented through a relief valve into space, carrying away heat, moisture and exhaled carbon dioxide. The suit was also regulated to ensure the pressure was kept at a constant. For such a short spacewalk, this should really do the trick. Pack light, I say, even if you're about to be the very first person to ever do a spacewalk. So, the plan was set, they launched into space, deployed the pressurised inflatable airlock, to which Pavel would control the airlock from inside the shuttle. Alexei would be the one to walk out into the airlock, but he also had some backup controls inside the pod, just in case there was any emergencies. These could be operated with using suspended bungee cords inside the airlock. So, he entered, he was sealed in and was able to walk freely. He looked down and reported that he could see the Straits of Gibraltar to the Caspian Sea. This must be a pretty awesome view, not gonna lie. This spacewalk was 12 minutes and 9 seconds long, starting in mid-Africa and ending up over Siberia. Okay, good job people, fantastic effort. Let's go home, was what they should have done. And there lies the problem, there was some uh, malfunctions in their ability to do that. Alexei had completed the main task and had just undertaken the first spacewalk ever, but as part of his job, he had to attach a camera to the end of the airlock to record his spacewalk, and to photograph the spacecraft. He managed to attach the camera without any problem. However, when he tried to use the camera still on his chest, the suit had ballooned and he was unable to reach down to the shutter switch on his leg. He turned into a chunky boy. After being in the airlock for 12 minutes, the suit had stiffened to the point where he could not re-enter the airlock. This required him to bleed out some of the pressure in his suit, so he could bend the joints to traverse back into the shuttle. Pretty scary stuff, but I imagine he's probably been well trained and to be prepared for such an event to happen. They managed to get inside and then had issues sealing the hatch properly, due to thermal distortion caused by Alexei's lengthy troubles returning to the craft. 
This then snowballed into problems upon re-entry to the Earth's atmosphere when the automatic landing system malfunctioned. The crew were forced to use the manual backup, which was further compounded by the fact that the shuttle was only small enough for the two astronauts who were unable to get back to their seats before going through re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere, meaning that the centre of mass in the actual craft was off balance. So the shuttle did not land in the designated location, but instead landed in the middle of nowhere in the upper Kama Upland, a remote woodland in Russia. Yes, a 46 second delay resulted in the craft going 240 miles off target. I mean, thankfully they were still in Russia, but where in Russia? It's a pretty big place, and where they landed was completely devoid of any civilization. So, whilst they weren't quite sure exactly where they were, what they did know was that this area in particular was very susceptible to hungry bears and wolves. So, they basically had to have their wits about them, because you never know. It also didn't help that it was also mating season, so the animals, the males in particular, were becoming pretty aggressive. So if you had two random Soviet astronauts land in your backyard, you're going to want to teach them a lesson or two. You might be thinking that two astronauts might be pretty screwed if they came face to face with a bear. But you have to remember, this is the Soviet Union. And of course, they had a loaded pistol on board, because of course they did. But thankfully they had this, because the gun was pretty much the only thing they had to protect themselves in case a bear did in fact try and um, greet them. Helicopters were unable to land in the dense woodland, so warm clothes had to be dropped for the crew to hunker down in the shuttle overnight during the freezing temperatures. Thankfully they weren't eaten by the local wildlife, and they were rescued two days later. But an incident like this led the USSR space program to develop a specialist survival pistol a triple barreled weapon that could be used against bears, because that sounds like something that you of course need when going into space. So yes, I just thought that this was an incredibly interesting story of this first spacewalk, how it was almost a failure, and how the crew almost got eaten by bears. I don't know about you, but when I was younger I always wanted to do the fantastically exciting jobs like being an astronaut. However, hearing a story about astronauts landing in a bear infested woods and having to sleep in a shuttle overnight where freezing temperatures went down to about minus 30 degrees isn't really my idea of fun, so I would rather have my feet firmly planted on the ground. And today we're talking about the Zambian space mission, which began in 1964. Oh boy oh howdy. The country of Zambia was originally a British protectorate in northern Rhodesia, taking its name from the Zambezi River, hence the name Zambia. Zambia was formed on the 24th of October 1964, and for a country having gained newfound independence, this was not only a strange time for the people of Zambia, but also the world, given that the Cold War was now in full swing. Two clashing ideologies fighting for technological dominance of the stars. Yes, this is all pretty high-flying stuff, and you'd imagine for a country like Zambia, a space program is probably not something on their agenda. However, for a newly fledgling country, why not reach for the stars? Quite literally. I mean, yes, Zambia's annual GDP in 1964 was only $839 million, which sounds like a lot, but it's really, really not. But how did this all come about? Well, they actually have to go back a few years prior, just before Zambia gained its independence, to a man called Edward Makuka Colosso, a science teacher and the self-appointed director of Zambia's unofficial National Academy of Science, Space Research and Philosophy. Yes, unofficial. He started this by stating that such a space program was in the national interest, aiming to beat both the US and the USSR to the moon during the heights of the space race. So, from the 1960s onwards, he would start his mission with the ultimate goal of sending a 17-year-old called Matha Mwamba and two cats to the moon. Dream big people. Whilst the country of Zambia wasn't yet a fully independent country of Zambia, they weren't far off, and the space program started in order to try and train the future astronauts of Zambia to be able to ready to be launched pretty much once the country gained its independence. As a matter of fact, they were so confident that this would work, they even said that after going to the moon, they would also go for Mars as well. Because, like I say, dream big people. To train the astronauts, Colosso set up a makeshift facility on an abandoned farm in which he instructed trainees to um, be rolled down the hill in giant oil drums. 
Nope, I'm not lying to you, this is exactly what they did. They put their future astronaut trainees in these giant oil drums, rolled them down the hill, then experienced the g-forces like you're hurtling through space, because I'm pretty sure that simulation is absolutely exactly what it's going to be like. This is a great way to train your astronauts on a shoestring budget, but he stated that the reason behind this was to train his future astronauts to feel the weightlessness in both space travel and re-entry from space. Sorry, sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to say astronauts, I meant Afronauts, because that is what they were aptly called the future of Zambia's space program, the Afronauts, which I think that they should probably be called that anyway, but there we are. Look, don't get me wrong, I'm a fan of this training exercise. I think it's a great way to train your astronauts to go to space. Although, I mean, I can't imagine many times where you might accidentally hurtle your space shuttle into a river because you know, you're rolling an oil drum down a hill which might go in a river. Look, I'm just trying to be realist here. This is all fascinating stuff, and these training aims were apparently legitimate. But I know what you're asking. Why on earth did they think that this was such an important endeavour for the Zambian people? He stated that his goal was to establish a Christian ministry to primitive Martians, and hoped that Zambia would become the controllers of the seventh heaven of interstellar space. Well, when you put it like that, then anything's possible. He did clarify and say that the astronauts wouldn't be forcing their Christian beliefs on the Martians, which is nice of them. But I think this is all secondary when you probably discover that intelligent life exists elsewhere, and you'd probably be asking many other questions before asking if they've ever read the Bible. But you never know. Maybe the Martians are out doing the same thing. Maybe they are also spreading the word of space Jesus, and you guys might be singing from the same hymn sheet and you don't even know it. For the mission itself, a rocket was built named the Dekalu-1, a 3 meter by 2 meter, 10 foot by 6 foot drum-shaped vessel. It was claimed that this rocket was made out of a space-worthy aluminium and copper material. So, we have a group of highly trained Afronauts ready to go on this space mission. You have this very, very reliable looking spacecraft, which is apparently space worthy, and on the day of the upcoming Day of Independence for Zambia, the 24th of October 1964, he planned to have his launch into space. The launch, however, was cancelled due to the fact that it was classed as inappropriate. Colosso then continued to try and push his agenda by seeking a grant of 7 million Zambian dollars and then a further 1.9 billion dollars from private foreign sources. But his requests were rejected due to the fact that he was not acting on behalf of Zambia. Basically, they realised that this was just one guy trying to roll people down hills in giant oil drums. So, pretty much due to the fact that there was a lack of funding for the project, it eventually shut down. Unfortunately. But Colosso would go on and say that the actual reason this happened was due to the fact that people didn't believe in his vision and also that apparently, without any evidence to prove it, the spaceship that he had was sabotaged. Um, the Zambian government in recent years has taken steps to try and distance themselves from this programme. As to any affiliation they had, I can't tell you, but it is a sad, sad world when we can't have one man in his dreams to take his people to space and to the moon and to Mars. And you know what? Just go anywhere you want. The world's your oyster. Or shall I say, the galaxy. So yeah, that was the one time that Zambia tried, and I put stress on tried, to go to space. And for those of you that believe that extraterrestrial life is out there somewhere, there is an insurance policy just for you. Particularly if you're the kind of person that believes that you could very well be abducted by aliens. It does make me wonder whether there's a lump sum premium on the fact that you may get probed. I don't know if there is or not, I'm just curious. Guys, I'm just curious how the policy works, but we're going to dig into it today and find out why this exists. Yes, in perhaps the most unusual insurance policy backing I've ever seen, people can be insured for the trauma and stress they'll experience in the event they ever get abducted by aliens. The first time any such known UFO insurance was offered was by the St. Lawrence Agency in Altamont Springs, Florida, and is said to have insured at least two claims for UFO insurance. The managing director of British Insurance, Simon Burgess, has even gone on record and said that anyone that gets this insurance is, quote, feeble-minded. 
But hey, what about those two insurance claims they dealt with, huh? Even though this was the first known offering of its kind, and even though they only dealt with two claims in total, this seemingly hasn't stopped people from going out there to try and get this type of insurance, for people that genuinely believe that this could happen to them. Brass tacks, at the end of the day, if the insurers are going to find a way to make some money off people, then you can bet your bottom dollar that is exactly what they're going to do. I'm sure it's not too difficult to find some people who believe that one day the mothership might come down and take them away. This isn't just a small group of people, however. Due to the demand for such insurance, many companies have decided on a similar offering for abduction insurance, so much so that Lloyd's London have allegedly sold 30 to 40,000 policies on just such an insurance policy. This policy was backed by a consortium of 26 insurers, mostly US and European, but operating on the London market. In order to be able to claim on your insurance, you need to be able to prove that, yes, you have been abducted by aliens. And the ways that this is normally proven is either through having video footage of it happening, going through a lie detector test, or possibly having witness testimony to say that, yes, they did see you get beamed up by the mothership. I mean, you can believe all the witness evidence and lie detector tests you want, but I think the one that everybody is really interested in is for these claims where they've submitted actual video proof. Undeniable proof that yes, you were abducted by aliens. It does make you wonder how you'd even go about getting this and how you'd be prepared for such an event happening. Do you just have to have a GoPro strapped to your chest for the eventuality that you might get abducted one day? Maybe. I, I don't know what to tell you. If this ever did actually happen and someone did have video footage of this occurring, my question wouldn't be so much why were you recording this, but it would be holy shit, aliens are actually real? One man called Joseph Carpenter received one million pounds or 1.6 million dollars on Christmas Eve from his insurer after he was able to prove a claim that he had been abducted by aliens. This was the first known payment of its kind a policy which would pay out by the underwriters in the events that he could prove that he was abducted, impregnated, or eaten by aliens. Nope, those are not my words, those were the exact words under the policy, and yes, he was able to prove that he was abducted. Mr. Carpenter paid an annual premium under his policy for £100, but was seemingly videotaped by nearby friends in the town of Swindon, being beamed aboard the spacecraft. On board, Mr. Carpenter claimed that he had telepathically spoken with an alien with a triangular head, who assured him that he shouldn't be afraid, before passing out. Yeah, if that was me, despite what the alien was telling me telepathically, mind you, I'd be pretty damn afraid. <laughs> Just gonna put it out there. Do you know what? No, no I would not be afraid. And I know the reason why. Because I would be on the alien spacecraft rubbing my hands together, knowing that I had insurance for just such an event. I was about to be walking into an absolute payday. You know, provided I get back home alive, mind you. Because uh, remember, there was a certain part of that policy that said that you would be able to claim if you got eaten by aliens. So I don't quite know how that fits into the whole puzzle here. After this happened, Mr. Carpenter even thought that he believed the whole ordeal. That was until the smoking gun was found. On his jacket, he had, and I'm not joking here, an alien claw attached to it. That was the evidence that would push this over the edge and make his insurance claim one in which the insurer pretty much had to pay out. This was enough to be paid out under the policy, which may or may not have been a hoax, but given the fact that the man went shark fishing immediately after the story came out, does make you wonder where he got that claw from it might look kinda like a shark tooth. The claw was sold to an unnamed US media agency for probably a hell of a lot of money. Strangely enough, after this whole ordeal though, nobody was able to track down who it was sold to, where the claw went, where the video footage went, anything. Everything seemed to kinda go dark, which does raise a few questions as to the legitimacy of this whole thing. However, I'll let you be the judge of that one. A particularly grisly account of people who have used such an insurance policy in the past related to an incident that occurred with 39 policyholders who had taken out the alien abduction insurance, 
who all decided to off themselves as part of the infamous Heaven's Gate cult. This organisation could be an entire video topic on its own, but in brief, the organisation was made up of people who believed that they could transform themselves into immortal extraterrestrial beings by rejecting their human nature, and that they would descend to heaven in something called the next level. It really does make you wonder what could possibly go through people's heads to make them think this was a good idea, and it's kind of sad really. As part of this, the 39 members decided to take out policies through the Lloyds of London insurance broker for alien abduction insurance. The cult members bought a policy in October 1996 for £1,000 or $1,600, which covered up to 50 members, which would pay out £1 million per person for abduction, impregnation or death caused by aliens. The beneficiary of the policy was the Society of Heaven's Gate, but a question was raised over if the policy would pay out as a result of an issue over insurance premiums not being kept up to date. In any event, there were doubts whether such a policy would be paid out, given the circumstances. Hence, when the news story eventually broke about what happened, and the fact that people were trying to claim under this insurance policy, they decided that it would probably be best if they didn't cover it, mainly because they didn't want to encourage other people to take some similar steps. And in the grand scheme of things, I think that was probably the right decision to make. Simon Burgess even commented on this incident at the time and said the following. Because of the manipulation of malevolent third parties, innocent lives were wrecked. I am deeply shocked and saddened, and that's why we're withdrawing from the market. We don't wish to contribute to a repetition of the Heaven's Gate deaths. So, really, ever since this happened, the offerings of such a policy have kind of dwindled, mainly because of the responsibility that is placed on insurers to make sure that incidents like this don't occur in the future. Yes, even insurance brokers have morals. Sometimes. And you're probably wondering who the hell this guy is, why he's got a bucket on his head, and why he's an intergalactic space lord. And we're going to talk about all those things today. Yes, we're diving into the very interesting world of British politics. Yes, I don't think anyone has ever uttered those words in their life before. But, when you've got someone like this involved on the ballot, things are going to get pretty interesting. And you'd be correct. In British politics, there is ample opportunity for a candidate to run either as an independent or even register their own political party, provided you meet a few basic requirements. This allows a joke or satirical candidate to run for the elections, such as the now infamous monster raving loony party, a man dressed as a fish finger, or even Elmo himself. Yes, Elmo. I mean, when you're conducting an interview and you've got this thing staring down your soul, you know you're going to be in for a rough day. What I think is absolutely brilliant about British politics is not only the fact that whenever they announce the results live on air, you can see people literally lose their jobs on TV, but the second best thing is when all the candidates line up in a row, you get to see every single person that ran for a certain seat, and on election night, it's pretty interesting. And yes, this even includes all the joke candidates that run in certain seats on election night. Whilst many of the joke candidates may only get a couple of hundred votes each, compared to the thousands of votes that the more established parties gain, imagine running against a well-known political figure and making history at the same time. That is exactly what Lord Buckethead did in 1987, when he ran against Margaret Thatcher in the general election at the time. So, who is Lord Buckethead and where did he come from? It's a pretty interesting and not really well-known story, so let's get into it. Lord Buckethead was originally created by American filmmaker Todd Durham for his 1984 science fiction film Hyperspace, a parody of the Star Wars franchise. And as you can tell from this very reminiscent poster and the fact that it looks awfully familiar to Darth Vader, except more bucket head shaped, the resemblance is uncanny. May I help you? Mike Lee, the British video distributor of the movie, seemed to like Lord Buckethead, so much that he adopted the character and formed the Gremloids party who ran against Margaret Thatcher at Parliament in Finchley in 1987. And yes, just in case you don't believe me, here is photo proof. And he also ran against John Major in the 1992 election as well. 
Now, this video would be nothing if we didn't talk about some of the campaign pledges that Lord Buckethead had during his time. Let me just read some of the more interesting ones to you. <clears throat> so, um, one campaign pledge said that Lord Buckethead made it his goal to seek that Birmingham would be completely demolished and make way for a spaceport. That is a man that has my vote. And what a stroke of genius this was. This guy is an intergalactic space lord that decides to run in the UK general election. This film should have gained an extra 10% rating on Rotten Tomatoes just for that fact alone. He received about 131 votes in the 1982 election and 107 votes in the 1992 election. That works out about 0.1% of the entire votes. And you thought politics was boring. And since then we didn't really see much of our Dark Lord. Until now. In 2017, Theresa May, the would-be Prime Minister, was running for her seat in Maidenhead, and it just so happened be that the Dark Lord descended from the stars and decided to run again on this general election trial, at the same seat that Theresa May was running for, which was brilliant. This time a different comedian had taken the reins, Jonathan Harvey, who stood as Lord Buckethead against Theresa May. Harvey decided to use Lord Buckethead after watching Gremloids and discovering that the character had already been used in earlier elections. Lord Buckethead's manifesto in 2017 promised strong, not entirely stable leadership, with campaign pledges such as reducing the voting age to 16 and restricting voting beyond the age of 80, the abolition of the House of Lords with the exception of Lord Buckethead, and pretty much the immediate ceasing of arms sales to Saudi Arabia so that Britain can purchase laser weaponry from Lord Buckethead instead. I think by far one of my favourite campaign pledges was, uh, let me just check exactly what he said. He was going to uh, <clears throat> exile Katie Hopkins to the Phantom Zone. That is brilliant. Almost as good as demolishing Birmingham. In the 2017 election, he received 249 votes, which was about 0.4% of the votes, and to be honest, with an improvement like that, if people keep voting for Lord Buckethead, who knows where he might be one day. All I know is that maybe in a few elections to come, he might actually be getting up there with the big dogs, which means that if I pledge my allegiance to Lord Buckethead right now, when he inevitably becomes Prime Minister, I will be spared from his fiery wrath. Yeah, go Gremloids! Yes, as fantastic as this election run was, and the fact that he only lost narrowly by 37,469 votes, it was pretty damn close. This time, however, the fact that Lord Buckethead was stood on the same stage as Theresa May added to the virality of the whole facade, and everybody discovering who Lord Buckethead actually was. This is all pretty impressive, but I think the most impressive thing of all is in 2017, that same year, he released a Christmas song. Yep. Many people don't know he released a Christmas song, for reasons I will explain shortly, but it's out there, you can watch it, and if you really want to see it, um, link in the sources. However, as you may notice, the video is currently unlisted, and that's for one very good reason. Yes, this had something to do with the fact that Jonathan Harvey and Mike Lee, who used the characters of Lord Buckethead, both did it without permission. Todd Durham, the original filmmaker of The Space Lord himself, shortly after the 2017 election, asserted his ownership over the rights of the character, meaning that Jonathan Harvey was no longer allowed to use The Space Lord Buckethead in the future. Sad times. Durham did have a proviso to this and said that even though he owned the rights to Lord Buckethead, people could still dress as Lord Buckethead going forward, and provided that they had permission, then people could still do this, particularly when it came to running in general elections. This led to the 2019 election, when Lord Buckethead was then played by David Hughes, which was specifically set up to call on a second referendum for that dreaded Brexit shenanigans. He was originally going to stand against Nigel Farage for the South East England's MP seat in May 2019 for the European Parliament elections, but he abandoned the bid shortly after trying this because he realised that if he did this it might actually have a detrimental effect and pretty much split the vote on this very decisive issue. And then we have the 2019 general election, you know, the one that Boris Johnson ran in. We saw Lord Buckethead yet again at the opinion polls. This time he would stand against Boris Johnson in his Oaksbridge and South Roy slip seat. However, our man Jonathan Harvey, who ran as Lord Buckethead in the 2017 election, also ran in the 2019 election. But this time he came with a new character called Count Binface. An awfully familiar character to that of Lord Buckethead, but fair enough. 
I imagine this had something to do with the copyright and legal wranglings he was part of before, so he decided to create his completely new, unique, original character that is largely based on Lord Buckethead, who was largely based on Darth Vader. So, um, yeah, it is what it is, I guess. And yes, whilst neither of them have actually won a seat as of yet, you know what, there's still time. I'm sure if the people of our country band together and decide to bow down to the intergalactic space lord, we might have ourselves, well, potentially, a space lord as an MP, which I think would make British politics just that bit more interesting. You might think that if you're an air traffic controller, you spend all day sat watching a screen, looking at planes come in and out. I mean, you wouldn't be wrong if that was the description you were going for, but there's a little bit more to it than that. If the job was really that easy, everybody would do it. And the fact that not many people can do it kind of gives you an inclination that there's a bit more under the hood. Reasoning for which we will be exploring today in this video. An air traffic controller's role is to direct air travel around the airspace of a certain country. Basically, these guys are employed to prevent collisions, control air traffic, and to organize when flights should come into land and embark on their journeys. The place you normally see air traffic controllers are in airports. You know, because that's where a lot of planes and aircraft fly in and out of. That only makes sense, right? Better than having a free-for-all when people come and go as they please. Using a mixture of radar and radio communication with the pilots in the air, they are able to know exactly where every single pilot is, at what altitude they're at, and how far away they are from their destination. So basically, the air traffic controller has access to all of this data, they're able to pull it all together and make sure that nothing disastrous happens in the air. So the next time you're on a flight and you're too busy watching Mamma Mia, there is somebody who is working relentlessly to make sure that your flight safely lands. The work that goes into this is quite a lot more extensive than you'd first think. Normally sat in large high up towers that look across an entire airport, they have a sight 360 degrees around the airport to see what's coming and what's going. At all times of the year, 365 days a year, come rain or shine, they were always there. Which to some might sound incredibly hard work given that you might be working late hours, but that's not what justifies the high salary. Yes, I can think of many jobs where you work strange or particularly long hours, but that's not the part of it which demands such high pay. It's the job itself. Air traffic controllers get paid so well, in fact, that your average air traffic controller in the US's highest paying states averages about $130,000 to $145,000 per year, with a similar salary of £100,000 plus each year if you're an air traffic controller in the UK. The reasons for this is the specialist set of skills that are required to even become an air traffic controller, and just the sheer responsibility that's on your shoulders. So let's tackle those one by one. Right, so I think the place to start with something like this is to look at how you even become an air traffic controller. Competition is so fierce that people will work relentlessly to try and get some of the limited roles that there is available. Say if you go into an industry, I'm thinking IT for example. Yes, it's a high demand job and there is probably a lot of work for people who are qualified in some area of IT. Dependent on your level of skill, you can probably find a job to use your skills. However, if you train to be an air traffic controller and you might not be quite up to snuff, then I don't think you'll be getting a job doing that anytime soon. Applications for college places at an ATC college normally receive thousands of applications each year for a somewhat measly hundred or so spaces. You're gonna need to be pretty brainy to begin with to even have a chance of getting through the first stages of your training. The reality is there just isn't enough demand for such a job which requires the right kind of person to even handle such a situation. However, if you manage to get in, good job. You're through to step two. From reports online of people who've attended these colleges, a large proportion of the attendees eventually drop out for one reason or another, which can be up to 50% or more in some cases. This shows that it is clearly not a walk in the park, but I guess people might not realize what's involved in the training and it might just not be for everybody. Open days, everyone. Try it before you buy it, that's what I say. Except if it's, you know, clothes, because 
can't really return those once you've stuck them on. Like I said before, if you've spent so long learning something for a highly specialised role and you don't get through, what can you realistically do with that experience? There's not really any other jobs, that I can think of anyway, where you'll be able to have some form of transferable skills. You've trained to be an air traffic controller, so you would probably go into the job of being an air traffic controller. Maybe if not that, maybe you'll be like a traffic signaller, you know, like a lollipop lady who stops traffic. Maybe. Guys, honestly, I didn't look into the logistics of this, okay? After graduation, you can then be allocated into the workplace, where you can then begin the formalised training on the job. Training which can take a number of years to pass. This is sort of like a transition from the education part of the job to the training on the field. Grab you by the arm and throw you in the deep end and see if you swim. I mean, with, with supervision of course. So, after completing your training and managing to be somewhat competent at being an air traffic controller, your salary will get a hefty pay increase. Basically increasing year upon year at pretty dizzying levels until you get to about five years on the job. And yes, once you get through the long, painful and arduous training regime, you are only at the beginning. Yes, you're getting paid pretty well, but you're still a novice. You need to build up your experience and, well, see what the job has to offer. The reality of the job, however, is that it is hard. There is a lot of responsibility on your shoulders as an air traffic controller. With thousands of people flying through airspaces every day, strict time schedules for flights embarking and arriving from all different directions and altitudes, considering ETAs, weather conditions, safety, there is a lot of room for error to occur. And that error is not just a slap on the wrist or a telling off from your manager. It's also the lives of many people at risk. So put it this way, if you're an air traffic controller and you're not very good at your job, you're going to realize that pretty quickly. Basically, you're gonna to need to be a hard worker. You're gonna to need to concentrate. You need to be calm under pressure. But more importantly than anything, you're gonna to need to be a good communicator. At the end of the day, communication is key to make sure that everybody knows what's happening. And at the end of the day, that's sort of your job. And these are of course all skills that I don't possess. So you're not gonna catch me training to be an air traffic controller anytime soon. I just thought it was pretty interesting to read upon. So, whilst an absolute liability like myself might not be up for the job, maybe someone out there might be. And, my god, please don't go ahead and apply for this job on my word. I'm just a guy on the internet. Do your own research, see if you think it fits you, and if it still does, go get them. If you liked the video, be sure to like and subscribe. If you want to be notified as soon as I upload my next video, be sure to hit the bell button. And if you've got any ideas for what topics you'd like me to discuss next, let me know down in the comments below. As always, sources used in the video will be in the description. Now, if I was an air traffic controller, first of all, I probably wouldn't even get that far, but if I ever did, I would basically be sitting there watching YouTube on one screen and maybe glancing back and forth at my other screen every now and again, making sure that two planes aren't going to collide into each other. And at the end of the day, there are much bigger consequences than my boss giving me a slap across the wrist. So I guess I'll stick to my day job and get a slap across the wrist for my manager for watching YouTube videos, because at the end of the day, the only person that's going to be at blame is me. So yeah, I'll see you guys in the next video. Fantastic.